Kanchanaburi, 130 kilometres west of Thailand's capital Bangkok, is a bustling town that's rich with history from the Second World War. It was from here that the Japanese undertook the construction of their Thailand, Burma or Death Railway. Kanchanaburi is uh, quite famous for the, the, the two cemeteries. Most people are familiar with the one larger cemetery based at Donlak in Kanchanaburi town centre. Um, the two cemeteries here contain the remains of service personnel that died during the construction of the infamous Thai Burma Railway during the Second World War. Where we find ourselves now is at Chung Kai. Uh, Chung Kai is uh, unusual in so much as you are standing on the original site of the Japanese prisoner of war camp. Um, troops were brought in via the river, um, billeted here before being deployed on various task force to uh, help in the construction of the railway moving from Banpong to cross the border into what is now Myanmar in the war known as Burma. More than 12,000 Allied prisoner of war, including servicemen from Britain, Australia, America and the Netherlands, along with almost 100,000 Asian labourers, died during the construction of the railway and the famous bridge over the River Kwai between 1943 and 1945. Today wreaths were laid by representatives of the Royal Thai uh, Police, Thai Army, the 9th Infantry Division, as well as former serving British veterans and the directors of some of the local schools. Uh, for them an introduction to some of the Western ceremonies that uh, we carry out as an act of remembrance. We were lucky enough to have a member of the Royal British Legion here to uh, recite the Act of Remembrance. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. We will remember them. <laughs> The Commonwealth War Graves Commission came about in 1917 uh, and during the First World War the amount of casualties started to mount and the British Army Graves Registration Unit um, obviously uh, needed some assistance uh, and that was the inception of the Commission. The subsequent wars from the First World War means that the Commission carries out operations in 150 countries and maintains the graves of approximately 1.7 million casualties. 
This is something I feel uh, passionate about now. There's no veteran alive we can talk to about the First World War. One day that will soon be the same as the Second World War. And the way that we can maintain that memory and that heritage is by sites like this. Although the Kanchanaburi area is best known for the World War II events, the team here have built a reconstruction of a typical battlefield trench from World War I, also known as the Great War. The idea of the trench came about between uh, some of my expat friends out here uh, and also in conjunction with the global project um, which is called the 1914-18 project which is uh, a project by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission which is uh, a number of events globally to commemorate uh, today's date which is the 100th anniversary of the start of the First World War. At this particular event here in Thailand um, is fairly unique in that we've constructed a replica of the 1914 to 1918 trench system in Europe. Part of the reasoning behind that was that the, um, the Siam Expeditionary Force went and fought in the trenches. During the First World War, the Kingdom of Siam declared war against the Central Powers uh, in July 1917 and sent the Siam Expeditionary Force. That was made up rather uniquely of 90 pilots, which were in very short supply at the time, and also a great number of medical and logistic staff. One of the key features of the, of the medical staff was that they included a great number of women um, uh, service personnel, who then also served rather uniquely on the front lines in the trench system in the 1914-18 war. So the trenches were synonymous with First World War in particular in that the fairly mobile initial um, phase of the war um, eventually led to a stalemate of land possession. Trenches were built initially as defensive positions and then became fairly static lines um, on both sides. And they then were developed further, again on both sides, into a series of trenches which led to a stalemate over several years until later on in 1918 when they, eventually there were some breakthroughs by the Allies. At the start of the war, trenches were just literally a hole in the ground. As the, the war bogged down, they became more and more uh, uh, organised uh, and structured. And you'll see in the trench that we have there today, it's not a straight line, a linear trench. And this would uh, enable people to take cover. If grenades or explosive rounds, artillery, landed in the trench, they could duck round a dog leg and they would be offered some protection from shrapnel. Also, the use of overhead protection would, would go over the top and there would be dugouts, uh, bomb shelters that people could go in. That overhead protection was critical in that 80 to 90% of casualties in the First World War came from artillery bombardment, be that mortars, artillery shells or even grenades, which became much more in use from 1915 onwards. So the trench was devised as, uh, as protection as much as they could. From, uh, from, from the enemy. Um, you see the classic machine gun pit with the Vickers machine gun emplaced, uh, an icon of World War I that caused untold casualties, a water-cooled machine gun that could basically keep firing for protracted periods of time, so long as you had water and ammunition. Um, the SMLE rifle, the classic British bolt action rifle, is incorporated in the trench as well. Another feature of, uh, of trench warfare was obviously everybody knew where you were. So to observe the enemy forces movement, the devices such as trench periscopes came into being, uh, where you could observe uh, enemy troop movement during the daylight. Um, moving in daylight hours was fraught with danger and any activities like re placing sandbags or putting in the uh, barbed wire was done at night um, because in, in daylight it was just almost fatal to consider moving anywhere. I'd like to thank uh, my friends and colleagues to make the effort that came here today, uh, including Kevin Fisher of CEA and particularly Joe Cox 
uh, who have uh, supported me in my greater role here in the Commission and uh, it's been very heartening to see the Royal Tar Army assist in doing some of the more back-breaking work of filling over a thousand sandbags so my heartfelt thanks go out to them. For CEA and me personally we wanted to do something today to honour the fallen and our heroes who's actually give us everything we have today. Me as, my, as a person, me as CEA and all my guys, we had to do something to honour these men and women. And I think there's been a big eye opener today for everybody as well, including myself. I never did realise that the ties were involved in First World War. It was brilliant to find all that out and to know that Thai ladies went and actually nursed in the trenches at the front line. I mean, who, who knows that? The children and the generation of today don't really understand what the grandfathers did back in World War I. So it's to reinstall the education and what everybody lost for our freedom. So for me personally, it's a very heartwarming project um, to, to be involved in because I have children and if we don't teach them, who will teach them? And that's why I feel so overwhelmed to be part of this project. For me, it was uh, nice to see uh, um, the local population involved as well as our expatriate colleagues to come down like that, uh, to take some time to reflect on an event of 100 years ago, which still resonates today. Um, and we only have to watch the news to see the problems still ongoing in the world. So to, to remember, and to educate people. Um, one of the uh, building blocks of the Commonwealth War Grave Commission is lest we forget.